Greetings, this is Doc Ock here, coming at you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central with another evening of storytelling, proverb relating, and of course, a Black Fact for tonight. Let's see what we got for today. This being almost the end of October, Halloween is coming up. But we promise not to play a trick, but we will deliver you a treat that just can't be beat if you just remain right there in your seat. Proverb for today. If the people think that they can buy everything or that everything is for sale, then there is little left of real value. If the people think that they can buy everything, or that everything is for sale, then there is little left of real value. Now, there's something to think about. Can you buy everything? Some people say money can buy you everything, but other people disagree. I'm one of those that would be in the disagree category. Let's look at our black facts for today. Now, we had one here from yesterday. I dog-eared it. That's going to help me somewhat keep up with these black facts. And the question was, if you know, no. Uh, did Jane M. Bolin become the U.S.'s first black female judge or district attorney? And she ended up becoming the U.S.'s first black female judge in the year 1939. So... We'll give you a new question tonight. Before we go, we'll give you a, new, a brand new question. So let me keep that one dog-eared for now, and let's go on. Now, um, I've talked about this book here previously, and as you may have realized, this is a collegiate edition of one of our of our, our Black Facts project. Okay, this is a collegiate um work. In other words, it's quite thick, quite long, very detailed with a um, fully everything, everything in here is fully referenced and indexed as, and then of course it's got a table of contents. And we deal with the history in here of black people in Ohio. And I'll just give you an idea. It's divided up into sections on activism. We deal with actors. Oh, we had all kinds of actors, Ruby D. Arsenio Hall, Halle Berry. Oh, wow. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I, only, I only detailed a few. There's still a lot more actors, but we had a lot of athletes. So we got a huge section of athletes, including Jim Brown, Ken Griffey Jr., LeBron, Michael Dokes, all kinds of athletes, businessmen, uh, educators, including Dr. Crosby from here in Kent, uh, inventors, um, Journalism, uh, people that were engaged in journalism, including the um, Post and Moses Fleetwood Walker. By the way, uh, the Colin Post was in part was founded by uh, one of the inventors, and that would be Garrett Morgan. Uh, military men, musicians. Then we deal with places, politics, writers, and then writers. So the person we read about yesterday, George Washington Williams. I put him under the section of politics. I also got the Stokes brothers, Carl and Lou Stokes and Stephanie Tubbs Jones. May their all their souls rest in peace. So, so we've got a lot of information in there. But we're going to come out of this book here with a story about the grandfather of black nationalism. Now, many of you probably would not know what black nationalism is. It merely is a is the idea which is not a an odd idea. It may sound odd to you at this point, but if you research it a little bit, you'll find out it's not odd at all that black people in the, in the United States of America have been trying to become part of the fabric of the United States, trying to integrate, trying to assimilate into American society for quite some time. And it's been very difficult to say the least because some people just don't see that as being a good thing. And so therefore, there's a lot of resistance to that whole idea. 
And so people have come up with other plans, like the American Colonization Society that Abraham Lincoln was in favor of, said, hey, well, why don't we send them all back to Africa? That was what Abraham Lincoln's final solution after the, uh, even after the Emancipation Proclamation was to just send black folks back to Africa. And he may have done that if he had lived long enough to implement that plan, but he didn't. The uh, other idea was to give black people our own state or our own territory, like the Indians, kind of put us on a reservation. And we'd have one state that would be our or one area that would be ours that we could operate. And then white folks would operate outside of that area. And Oklahoma was it for the Native Americans. That was where they finally, the, 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 the final corral, because there were a number of reservations, including right here in the great state of Ohio. So, uh, but that didn't happen either because when they found oil in Oklahoma, that was the end of that reservation. So uh, Martin R. Delaney, he had some ideas about that and what we should do and what the solutions should be. But let's just deal with him, the man and his history. And the title to our piece today is called Major Martin R. Delaney grandfather of black nationalism. So it's the longest title I've ever had to use because of, because of the fact that he had a long title. I couldn't really abbreviate it either. So Major Martin R. Delaney, born 18 and 12, died 1885. He was born free. And here they say that he also was engaged in some ethnology study of races, racial backgrounds, things of that nature. So let's see what is his story. I thank God for making me a man simply, but Delaney always thanks him for making him a black man. So says Frederick Douglass of his old friend, Major Martin R. Delaney, spokesman, physician, explorer, and scientist. Martin R. Delaney was indeed proud of the Gullah and Mandingo blood that which flowed in his veins. He was one of the leaders in the great debate following the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. His pride of race was so great that he became a spokesman for those who felt that America was too inhospitable for persons of African descent. After serving as a prime mover in several conventions of free Negroes to discuss the possibility of immigrating to Africa, in 1859, Delaney led the first and only exploratory party of American-born Negroes to Africa. In the region of the Niger River, Delaney's party carried out scientific studies and made agreements with several African chiefs for the treatment of prospective immigrants from America. Trained in the natural sciences, Martin Delaney attended the International Statistical Conference meeting in London in 1860 and read a scientific paper before the Royal Geographic Society. Now, you know, they don't even let you in those meetings unless you're somebody. When Lord Brogham co commented favorably on Delaney's presence at the conference, several Southern delegates withdrew from it because there's always some of them around. Even before the Fugitive Slave Law was passed, Delaney had made a reputation as a writer and speaker on abolition and immigration. He helped Frederick Douglass to edit the North Star from 1847 to 1849. He received his medical and scientific training at Harvard and practiced medicine in Chicago and Canada. When not practicing medicine, he often traveled about the country speaking on abolition. Once in Ohio, he was almost fatally beaten by a mob, but continued to speak for the cause of freedom. Delaney was a freeborn native of Charleston, West Virginia, but spent his youth as in Pennsylvania where he was taken to be educated. It was there 
that he became interested in seeking solutions to the plight of the black man in America. For a short time, he published his views in his own newspaper called The Mystery. After gaining journalistic experience with Douglas, Delaney published two major books. The Condition of Elevation, Immigration, and Destiny <coughs> excuse me, of the Colored People of the United States. Politically Considered, 1852, and Principia of Ethnology, The Origin of Races and Color, in 1879. His devotion to the cause of freedom led him to seek audience with President Lincoln in 1865 to propose an army of Negroes commanded by Negroes. Although he was not successful in persuading the president to do this, he was commissioned a major in the U.S. Colored Troops, the first of his race to be honored, to be so honored. He also served with the 109th Regiment. After the war, he worked with the Freedmen's Bureau for three years. Delaney later became a customs inspector in Charleston, South Carolina, and then a trial justice in the same city. Delaney died on January 24, 1885. So there's a thread right there running through there between him and um, the person we read about last night, which was George Washington Williams, that George Washington Williams also had gone to Africa. Now, why had he gone to Africa in the first place? This is an interesting question. I'm not really sure exactly why, but I'll be, we'll be reading and learning more about him and his life as well as Martin R. Delaney as we go on. So that's a question. You can just write that question down. Why did he go to Africa? Did he go for the same reason Delaney did? Did he go for the same reason that Paul Kofi did earlier on back in the early, uh, early 1800s? Because you remember, we read about Paul Kofi. He had gone back to Africa and took nine families with him and left them in Africa. Now we hear about George Washington Williams in Congo to see what was going on in the Congo. And actually he ended up dying in, um, on his way back from Nigeria. He ended up dying in Britain. That's how George Washington Williams ended up dying in London, England, or in, uh, excuse me, uh, Blackpool, England, as opposed to dying in the U S he was in transit returning to the U S from Nigeria. And then there's a story um, also of other people from the, also from Ohio, who also had thoughts of going back to Africa and not not to mention, um, and also there were military people as well in, in a number of cases. And also of, um, what's his name? Um, Alan Allensworth, who I'm not going to be able to go into in, in this month, but we'll have to get to him in another month. We'll come back to Alan Allensworth, who founded a black town in California. So all of these people had been successful. They'd been promoted. They'd become officers in the U.S. Army. They were well-educated, et cetera. But each and every one of them came to the conclusion that the only real opportunity black people were going to have to, to live um, without restriction because of their, because of our color and our race was to leave the country and move to Africa or found our, our own separate towns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's, uh, so that's how Martin R. Delaney becomes the grandfather of this idea of black nationalism. But he was definitely not alone. There were others that thought just like him or in a very similar manner for, based on their experiences. So that's all we have for tonight. Oh, let's go back to our question. I didn't give you your new question for tonight. This will be for tomorrow. Question for tomorrow will be, who became the, thought I asked that question already, but maybe not. Let's make sure. 
because I got this one here dog ear. Now I'm dog earing him as I go. So who became the first black female mayor of, of uh, Washington, D.C. in 1990? Was it Loretta Glickman or Sharon Pratt Kelly? Those are your two choices. And then we'll give you, I'll give you the answer at the beginning of our, our uh, program tomorrow, our live stream tomorrow, and I'll give you a new question for tomorrow night. And so we're going to try and do almost like doing two a day. I'm just have to speed it up a little bit so that we can we can catch up because we have really fallen behind on our black facts. And by the way, I realize that some of these black facts questions are somewhat obscure. Uh, I'm using questions, somebody else's questions. I didn't write the questions. So I'm, typically I'm using other people's questions and I'm seeing the need now to write up my own questions because these questions, I don't even understand why, the, why they're asking some of these questions. And I wasn't in on the discussions as to why they're asking these kind of these particular questions. So I'm going to have to come up with some better questions. So we'll see how that goes. But in the meanwhile, I'll be still using these for a while longer. So you just have to, you have to stretch your minds, stretch your minds and Google a lot. In the meanwhile, all you little children out there, it's time for you to put your little heads on your little pillows, on your little beds, close those yeah, yeah eyes and wait for that sun to rise. And when you feel those sunbeams beaming on your eyes, it should be no surprise. You know exactly what time it is. You don't need a clock. You don't need a watch. You don't need your cell phone or anything else. You already know what time it is. So don't be burning daylight when the sun hits. Don't let the sun catch you crying. When that sun comes through that window, bam, you should be getting up. No matter what, just go on and get up. When the sun comes through the window, time to get up. Simple as that. As for you adults, you know the deal. Let's be for real. We're on, uh, we're, it's at, we're at uh, October 25th and we're still grinding it out. Looking for those good old donations. We've got some from last month, but we need a whole lot more. Small are good. The larger, the better. Regular donations, a small regular donation is better than no donation at all. You can make $5 a month. Just make that a thing. You can set it up automatic payments. You don't even have to think about it where it'll automatically do that. Just hit the click the, the button below on um, Facebook and you can sign up there with um, an organization that has dutifully been sending us your donations. So that's one way to donate. The other way is to click the Amazon smile button. I'll be posting those up and moving them around a little bit more. So they keep popping up. So you'll keep seeing them. Join Amazon Smile. When you join Amazon Smile, every time you go to order something from Amazon, you just order it through a, a particular page that is the, has the Amazon Smile logo. Looks just like the regular Amazon logo, except it's a kind of a bright orange, orange with the, uh, white letters. And that's the only difference. Otherwise, nothing. Oh, plus the difference is that when you click the button on... Um, Facebook that it will, or on our website, it will take you directly to the Amazon Smile page that's already set up for our organization. So you don't have to pick and choose which organization that you want Amazon to donate money to. You won't be making the donation. You're telling Amazon who to donate some of the money you've been giving them already without designating who they give it to. So why let Amazon decide when you can decide? That's just exercising a little bit of Kuji Chagalia. Get used to it because we're going to be doing this more and more. I, I understand we're going to be in for a rough ride this winter. So let's get ready. Get busy. It's time to get down and stop walking around with a big old frown on your face. Turn that frown all upside down and all you'll have is a smile. We're just asking you to make it an Amazon smile. Yeah. Peace out now. We'll see y'all tomorrow. This is Doc Ock at, at noon and nine signing off. Look for us black here tomorrow at noon and again at nine and everything is going to be real fine.